Remember having the talk as a kid? Yes, that talk. The one about the birds and the bees? It was embarrassing and awkward, but also important. Our parents might have assumed the talk was just a one-time thing. Once we learned the basics, everything else would just fall into place. But the world is changing fast, and the questions are getting more complex. So let's go there and look with courage at sexuality and identity. It's time to move the conversation beyond the birds and the bees. All right. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to Eaglebrook Church. Thank you for being with us today. Really appreciate that. If you're at a campus, if you're watching online, it's great to have you uh, with us. We are in the second and final week of a series called Beyond the Birds and the Bees. And if you're a parent, you kind of knew at some point you were going to have the conversation with your kids. And the talk or that conversation was the birds and the bees. It was how babies are made. And you sort of knew what to expect in that. It was going to be awkward for you. It was going to be even more awkward for your kids. But you kind of knew what to expect. These days, we're beyond the birds and the bees. These days, you might get questions from your son or daughter like, should I be attracted to boys? Should I be attracted to girls? What about both? These days, you might have your 8-year-old come upstairs and say, you know, I saw a commercial where two women were kissing. What's up with that? We are officially beyond the birds and the bees. Last week, I talked about gender identity, and among other things, I said that our core identity in life is that we are a child of God, that we are made in God's image, male and female, and my purpose in that message was really to help parents and teenagers who are having some confusion around gender, gender identity, and attraction. If you missed that message, I would encourage you to go back and watch it. Today's message is titled, Healthy Sexuality. Most of us have not grown up with a picture or model of what healthy sexuality looks like. I mean, just think about the TV shows that you've watched or the movies that you've seen. Generally, the single people are hooking up with a lot of different sexual partners, and they seem real happy doing it. Meanwhile, the married people are bored. That's kind of the punchline in the sitcom, that sexual intimacy within marriage is boring. And so we've grown up not really knowing what does healthy sexuality look like. Add to that the fact that researchers are now saying that the average age that kids are being exposed to pornography is 12. Add to that the fact that sexual abuse is at an all-time high. And I don't think it's controversial to say that what we're doing in America today is not working. The problem is not sex. God created sex. Sex was God's invention. It was his idea. It's a gift from God. The problem is, is that we have distorted sex. So my purpose in this message, if you're single, is to help you have a healthy foundation of what sexuality looks like. My purpose is if you're married or a parent that you can talk to your kids about this important conversation and maybe increase the sexual intimacy in your marriage as well. Last week, I set some ground rules for this series, and I just want to quickly revisit those. The first one is that I don't have time to address every objection or situation. So about a year ago, I started reading every book, every article, listening to every podcast that I could about gender and about sexuality. And I realized that I needed a full year to prepare for this series. Quickly, early on, I thought, you know what, there's no way in a 35-minute message that I can answer every objection or experience. So there might be something in the message today, we go, well, wait a minute, what about this? Or that's not been my experience. And I would say, yeah, I know, but I can't address every objection and experience in a 35-minute message. The second ground rule is, if we disagree, let's disagree well. We live in a world today that tends to kind of think, hey, if you disagree with me, I don't want to have anything to do with you. I'm going to block you. I'm not going to hang out with you. I'm not going to have a relationship with you. And I don't think that's healthy. If you're here today and you're like, I don't know what I believe about Jesus. I'm not even sure that the Bible is my source of truth. I'm so glad that you're here. And you're probably going to hear some things today that you say, you know what? I don't necessarily agree with that. But that's okay. We can still be in a relationship. We can still attend church together. We can still love each other. By the way, this cuts both ways. 
So if you hear something in this particular message and you really agree with it, I'm going to ask you to refrain from clapping. Because as I was talking to people throughout this series, as preparing for this, I realized that if someone's on the other end of the aisle, they can feel ostracized and unwelcome in that moment. And I don't want them necessarily to feel that way. Third, our approach is to speak the truth in love. So an immature Christian is going to speak the truth. They're going to go, hey, I'm going to tell it like it is, but their tone and their attitude is unloving. An immature Christian loves people, but they don't, they disregard the truth. They compromise the truth. A mature believer in Christ says, I'm going to speak the truth, but I'm going to do so in love. And so my goal in this message is to be full of truth and full of grace, to speak the truth, but to do so in love. All right, in Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible, God speaks to Adam and Eve. They're the first human beings. And he says to him, hey, you can eat from any tree that you want in this garden except that one. And it's like when you tell your kids, don't touch that. What do they become obsessed with doing? They want to touch the stove or whatever you told them not to touch. And so Adam and Eve eat from the one tree that God tells them not to eat from. And here's what it said happened next. So said, then the eyes of both of them, Adam and Eve, were opened And they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now prior to this, it says that Adam and Eve were in the garden and they were naked and unashamed. In other words, when sin entered the world, shame entered the world along with it. Most people that I know have some amount of shame and baggage when it comes to sex and sexuality. So my hope in this message is not to add to your shame. My hope is that we can heal by God's power. But what did Adam and Eve do next? They hid from God. They heard God coming into the garden. They're like, oh boy, we don't want to talk to God about this. And we've been hiding ever since. But here's my question. If kids don't learn about sexuality in church or from their parents, where are they going to learn about it from? Netflix, YouTube, online, from their friends, in the back of the bus. So the question I want to ask today is this. What does the Bible say about healthy sexuality? I think we all know what our culture says about healthy sexuality. And I think we all know that's not working real well. So I want to just offer up an alternative. What does the Bible, what does God's word say about healthy sexuality? Here's the first thing that I think it says. Sex is reserved for the context of marriage. Let me read to you this verse from Hebrews chapter 13. It says that marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Now you hear that and you think, okay, well, he's talking about adultery. Well, that's not all he's talking about, because notice that there's two categories. He says the adulterer and the sexually immoral. When you see the phrase sexually immoral or sexual immorality in the Bible, here's what it means. It means to have sexual intimacy or lust outside the context of marriage. It's not just something that we kind of make up on our own what we think sexual immorality is. There was a very specific meaning when it communicated those words. So it's not the same thing. Maybe this visual will help you a little bit. Here here I have a fire pit, and I'm just going to go ahead and light this on fire really quick here. I'm not. Facilities would kill me if I did that. But if I were to light it on fire, we would be perfectly fine because when a fire is contained, it brings enjoyment, it brings warmth to a person's life. In the same way, when sex is contained within the context of marriage, it brings joy, it brings intimacy to a person and to a relationship. But what happens when a fire is not constrained? Well, that's called a wildfire. And a wildfire burns things that you didn't want it to burn. It destroys things you didn't want it to destroy. Sex is the same way. When sex is outside the constraints of a marriage relationship, you might end up burning something you didn't want to burn or destroying something that you didn't want to destroy. I talk to people all the time, I pray with people all the time who started the fire of sexual intimacy outside of marriage and now they're dealing with the scar tissue and the baggage that they bring into future relationships. Just consider a few of these statistics with me. Of those who were divorced in a recent study, 
they found that 60% of them cited pornography as a contributing factor to their divorce. They did a study several years ago and found that in the last 30 years, living together before marriage is up 700%. So in the last 30 years, we've decided that if you want to have a great marriage, if you want to have a long-lasting marriage, you'll live together first to try it out, up 700% in the last 30 years. The problem is, of of those couples who lived together before marriage, they were 80% more likely to have their marriage end in divorce than those who didn't live together before marriage. The Heritage Foundation conducted a study with teenagers, and they asked the question, does sexual activity as a teenager affect other areas of your life? They found that young girls who were sexually active before marriage were four times more likely to say that they were depressed most or all of the time. I read that and thought, why are we doing this to young people? If you're a young person here today and you're saying, you know what, I'm going to wait until marriage to have sexual intimacy. I've got my whole life to look forward to that. I'm going to wait. I'm telling you, you are wise. You are being wise. You are saving yourself some scar tissue and baggage that you will carry with you into future relationships. Now you say, well, that's not great news because I've already done that. I've already been sexually active outside of marriage. Here is the thing that I love about Jesus Christ. You are one moment. You are one moment away from saying, God, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I repent. I turn away from it. Will you forgive me? And God will not only forgive you, but he will wipe the record clean and he will make you a whole new creation. It is never too late in your life to commit to God's way. What is God's way? What is this picture of healthy sexuality? What does it look like? Well, first of all, it looks like commitment. And when I say commitment, I don't just mean we love each other. I don't just mean we're living together. I'm talking about the kind of commitment that happens when you enter into the covenant of marriage. The kind of commitment that happens where you can't just go, you know what, I'm going to text you, call you, and just say, hey, let's just break up. The kind of commitment that happens when you can't just say, I don't want to live here anymore. I'm going to take my toothbrush and go back to my apartment. I'm talking about the kind of commitment when you stand before God and you enter into the covenant of marriage. What does healthy sexuality look like? It's intimacy. Many people think that sexuality is purely a physical feeling. It's not. There's emotional components. There's spiritual components. The Bible says that it's two flesh becoming one. There's intimacy. There's emotion. What is healthy sexuality? It's selfless. So much of our sexual distortions today are because of selfishness. I want you to make me feel something. I want to feel something, and you can give me that feeling, and oh, you don't want to give me that feeling? Well, I'm going to pressure you. I'm going to coerce you. I'm going to manipulate you. I'm going to power over you because I want to get what I want. Selfish. Healthy sexuality is selfless. It's not just thinking about what I want, but it's thinking about what you want and you need. What is healthy sexuality? Well, healthy sexuality is based on healthy relationships. Relationships that have a foundation of Christ. Relationships that are built on trust and friendship. In other words, healthy sexuality starts before you get to the bedroom. My friend Ted Cunningham gave a message where he talked about this. I want you to see what Ted says. I want to give you a list on how to prepare your wife for a night of romance. Okay, and if you haven't taken any notes, this is the time to start. (laughs) And get your phone out and you start writing it down because we believe in our home, men are microwaves, women are crockpots. (laughs) That's number one. We actually got a candle that we call the crock pot candle. And when that candle's lit, it means tonight's the night. I taught my kids to play with matches. You guys light that thing anytime you want. I've lost count of how many times we've blown the candle out because of you kids. 
But the candle can be lit, and it means, okay, we have all day. So guys, this is all day. We're preparing her for a night of romance. Okay, number one, it starts early in the morning. Number two, give her a non-sexual touch before you leave the house. That's, that's what we call an NST, okay? <laughs> Dr. Gary Smalley says you need 12 of those a day, and it's not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. <laughs> you know what a non-sexual touch is, right? It's the hair over the ear. It's a hand on the back. Is it the, maybe opening a door and the hand on the small of the back? Driving down the road, a hand on the thigh, holding hands, a gentle kiss on the cheek, that's a non-sexual touch, okay? Call her during the day, just add it to the list. Call her during the day for no purpose other than to connect with her. Just to say, hey, how you doing? I'm just calling to say, I want you to know I'm at work, but I'm thinking of you. Mm. Get home a little bit early. Do something domestic. <laughs> the sound of a husband vacuuming is foreplay. <laughs> if you beat your wife home, get the dishwasher started. You, the key here is you don't even need dishes in it. Just get the dishwasher started. There's going to be some dishwashers going after church today, okay? <laughs> Just be prepared. Now, I don't know if any of that would work. I don't know that, I don't think that would work for me. But here's his point. Healthy sexuality starts before you get to the bedroom. Healthy sexuality is based on healthy relationships. God created sex. It is a gift from God. But God says, here is the constraints. Here's where it's done in the most healthy of fashion. God created sex to happen within the context of marriage. Here's the second truth that I believe that the Bible says about healthy sexuality. It's this, that marriage is between a man and a woman. So if sex was between, um, um, in a marriage relationship between a husband and a wife, what is marriage? Well, it's to be between a man and a woman. Let me read to you what Jesus says about this. This is Matthew 19. Jesus said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, this is marriage, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. I had a woman email me one time after a message. She said, I was really offended when you said that marriage was between a man and a woman. And for the life of me, I couldn't remember saying that in the message. I thought, I don't think I said that. And so I went back to my manuscript and I looked and I had quoted this verse from Jesus. And so part of what I responded back to her is I said, I didn't say that. This isn't just my opinion. This isn't something that I wrote in my, on my, in my office. This isn't just our church's stance. I said, these are the words of Jesus Christ. If you consider yourself a follower of Christ, you have to wrestle with this. I don't understand when people say, I believe in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. But when it comes to sexual ethics, you know, I've got a few different opinions. Jesus seems pretty clear that God created us male and female, and that marriage is to be between a man and a woman. Now, you, you hear that, and the logical question that you're probably wondering is, what about same-sex relationships? What about same-sex marriage? And before I answer that question, I want to speak to those of you who are in same-sex relationships and in a same-sex marriage. I want you to know that you are welcome in this church. And I'm not just saying that because that's kind of the thing to say. When I meet a couple from our church who is in a same-sex relationship or marriage and they tell me they go to Eagle Brook, I am so grateful that you attend this church. In fact, as I was preparing for this message, I met with several people who identify or are in a same-sex relationship and I said to some of them, what would you want people to hear in this message? And one of the guys who goes to our church said, what I would want people to hear is that no matter what, they are valuable to God. I said, I am going to quote you on that. Every single person has value to God. Every single person has worth before God. And so our church is not against you. Our church is for you. We truly want the best for your life. But it's in that spirit of wanting the best for your life that I want to read what the Bible says about same-sex behavior and same-sex relationships. 
And I hope you understand that I wouldn't be faithful to God if I wasn't teaching something just because I was afraid people would be upset. I wouldn't be faithful to God if I was saying, well, I'm just not going to touch that one because people might not like me. And so I want to teach to you, what does the Bible say about same-sex behavior and same-sex relationships? And if you're a person who says, you know, I, I'm not sure I believe the Bible is my source of truth in life, then again, I don't necessarily expect you to agree, but I do think it's important that we know what it says. There are six, relation, or six verses in the Bible that speak directly to same-sex behavior and same-sex relationships. I'm just going to read two of them to you. These are from the New Testament. This is 1 Corinthians 6. I'm just going to read it. He says, Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Neither the sexually immoral or idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says, All that is, all that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, few observations about this verse. First of all, the focus is on same-sex behavior, not same-sex attraction. It's not a sin to be attracted. It's not a sin to have desires or feelings. Same-sex attraction is different than same-sex action. Second observation is that same-sex behavior is not singled out in this verse. If you remember, he talks about heterosexual sins, such as adultery and sexual immorality. He talks about humanity sins, such as greed and slander. So same-sex behavior isn't singled out. In other words, it's just as displeasing to God when a person is greedy or when a guy is sleeping with his girlfriend as if he was sleeping with his boyfriend. It's not singled out. The third observation from this verse is that it's not the unforgivable sin. Because notice what he said in the verse. He said, you used to live this way, but you were washed, you were justified by Jesus Christ. Romans 1 might be the most important verse in the New Testament on this issue. Here's what it says. It says, even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now, I want you to notice his point here. His point is the natural order of God's creation, the way in which God created sexual intimacy and sexuality is for men and women. Anything outside of that is unnatural, and we see this every day. It's evident in science with our reproductive organs, with our external anatomies. The creation and intent of God is evident. Now, you might say, but yeah, but you can, you can interpret the Bible however you want. And I would say you're right, and people do try. But when you ask the question, what is the historical context, and what was the author trying to communicate? giving the author that courtesy of what were you trying to communicate when you wrote this, you realize that there's good interpretations and there's bad interpretations. There's interpretations of the Bible that are faithful to what it says, and there are others that say, let's twist this to fit our own opinion or cultural trends. Now you might say, but yeah, but Jesus never brought up same-sex behavior or relationships. And I would say that that is true. But there's a lot of things that Jesus didn't talk about. As I mentioned last week, Jesus was Jewish. He ministered to a predominantly Jewish audience. And within Judaism, this was a settled issue. Because of verses in the Old Testament, it wasn't controversial. And so it wasn't a topic that was relevant for Jesus to address. Paul, on the other hand, is writing to Gentile audiences in Rome and Corinth, where same-sex behavior and relationships were quite common. So it was relevant for him to say more. Now you say, well, that's Paul. Well, I would say Peter, who was Jesus' closest follower and friend, in one of his letters says that Paul's writings are scripture. In other words, they're on the same level as Jesus. Here's what I want us to see. If what I have read is true, then logically speaking, 
The most loving thing to do is to lovingly caution people against same-sex behavior or relationships. To say to someone, just do whatever you want, don't worry about the consequences, is more about loving myself. I just want you to like me, I don't want you to be offended by me, I don't want you to be mad at me. But sometimes what love requires is to speak the truth in love. Before I leave this point, I need to mention that the whole purpose of Romans chapter 1 is not to condemn gay people. The whole purpose of Romans chapter 1 is to condemn all people. It's to say that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so before we start pointing the finger at someone else's sexual sin, we ought to point the finger at ourselves first. Here's the third truth of healthy sexuality in the Bible. It's this, God's will is better than our will. There's only four places in the Bible where God explicitly says, this is my will. And one of them is related to this issue of sexuality. He says this, it is God's will that you should be holy, that you should be set apart, that you should be pure, that you shouldn't be like everyone else around you. That's God's will. He says that you should avoid sexual immorality. Here's the question I want to ask you today. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God's will is better than our will? Do you believe that there are times in your life when you go, but yeah, but this is what I want, and this is what's going to feel so good, and this is what's going to make me so happy? That if you say, you know what, God, I'm going to set aside my will for your will, that your life will be better off as a result. When God says, don't do this, what he means is don't hurt yourself. Don't harm yourself. The reason that God says don't have sexual intimacy outside of marriage is not because God's trying to hold you back. It's not because God's going, oh, this is going to be really fun. You're going to have such a great weekend. I don't want you to have fun. No, he's saying it because he's saying, I love you, and I don't want you to have that baggage that you're carrying into future relationships. The reason that God says what he does about same-sex behavior is not because God's on a power trip. It's not because God is from a political party or God wants to oppress a certain group of people. The reason that God says that is because he loves people and wants the very best for their life. Just to consider a few of these studies with me. As I mentioned last week, when it comes to the issue of sexuality, you can find a study that will back up your opinion. I mean, they're just all over the map. And so what I try to do is look for peer-reviewed studies that were medically accredited and weren't funded by uh, someone who has kind of had a slant on it. And to do that, I had to oftentimes go outside the United States. For example, in one study done in the UK, they found that people who were engaging in same-sex behavior were 50% more likely to say that they were depressed. In Sweden, they found that those engaging in same-sex behavior were 300% more likely to take their own life. And you say, well, that's because of the stigma. That's because of the bullying that exists. And I would agree with you that stigma and bullying is a major problem. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ here today, and you're bullying someone, or you're, you're creating some discomfort in a person's life because of their sexual orientation, that is not God's way. It's not God's way at all. But Sweden legalized marriage in 1944. It was listed by the International Gay Association as the most gay-friendly country in Europe. If ever there was a country where there was less stigma and less bullying, it would be Sweden. And yet their numbers are as high or higher than other countries. Something else is going on. The life expectancy for people who engage in same-sex behavior is 20 years less than the average. I heard another pastor from Texas use this analogy. He said, imagine if I was moving to a town. And in that town, I was 50% more likely to be depressed. I was 300% more likely to take my own life. And my life expectancy was 20 years less than if I had lived in another town. Would it be loving to encourage them to move to that town? We've been so conditioned in our culture to believe that if you lovingly caution someone against same-sex behavior or relationships that you're hateful or you're a bigot. And I wonder if the opposite is true. I wonder if the mindset that says, hey, just do whatever you want, don't worry about the consequences, is really the most unloving approach. There is a difference between love and affirmation. 
People say, well, if you love me, you'll affirm me. I say, hold on, hold on a second. I can love you but not affirm every belief or behavior in your life. We all do this. I do this with my kids. My wife does it with me. We can love people but not necessarily affirm every belief or behavior in their life. And this brings up two important questions. And the first one is, if you're a parent and your son or daughter comes to you and says, I have same-sex attraction, what should you do? Now, I said this last week, love your son, love your daughter. Don't abandon them in the struggle. If anything, move closer to them. You may not agree with every belief or behavior, but they should never doubt your love. They should never doubt your loyalty as a parent. Many people who have same-sex attraction come to churches and they feel unloved, and that is a tragedy. If you're here today and you're in a same-sex relationship, I really do hope that you'll wrestle with the verses I read earlier. I really do hope that. But I also want you to know that no matter what, we will love you and walk alongside you. And if you're a young person here today and you're experiencing same-sex attraction and maybe there's feelings or thoughts that you don't know what to do with and you don't know who to talk to, send a contact us email to our church. One of our pastors would love to meet with you. Not to press an agenda, but to listen to you, to love you, to help you in any way. Second question is this. What if you experience same-sex attraction, but you want to follow Jesus? I think this question says a lot about who you are. Just the fact that you're asking it says a lot about your character because it takes a strong person to say, here's what I want, but I'm willing to give up what I want if I believe that God wants something different for me. In fact, I don't love it when speakers like myself will say, try to relate and go, you know, I can't just have sex with any woman I want. If I was in a same-sex relationship, I'd be like, well, boo-hoo. Like, at least, at least you get to have intimacy with your wife. Well, what are my options? I also don't love it when people promise that if you have same-sex attraction and you just pray hard enough and trust God enough that those attractions will change. I've seen God do that. I've seen that happen in people's lives, but I've also seen it not happen. And so the question I want to ask is, what if you want to follow Jesus, but you experience same-sex attraction? And I'm going to share with you one word. And this word, when I say it out loud, some of you are going to look like you sucked on a lemon. You're going to be like, what? Some of you are going to roll your eyes. You're going to laugh to yourself. You're going to be, who is this guy? This is ridiculous. The word itself, even when I say it, I'm kind of uncomfortable with the word. It's a word that our culture shuns, but I believe it's a word that for some people God embraces. And the word is celibacy. Since the 1970s and the sexual revolution, we have been sold the thought that if you're having sex, well, then you're happy. I mean, every movie, every TV show is about meeting someone, finding someone, hooking up with someone. And so we tend to think if I'm not doing that, if I'm not having sexual intimacy, well, then I'm just not going to be as happy as other people. I won't be as fulfilled as other people. That that's what's truly going to fulfill me and make me happy and joyful in life. And I am telling you that is not true. That is not true at all. I know people who hook up on the weekend with multiple people and they're miserable. I know other people who are choosing to say, I'm not going to do this in this time of my life, and they are filled with joy. Our happiness in life is not dependent upon whether or not we're having sex. I know people in our church who are doing this. I know people who are saying, here's what I want, but I realize not every desire is meant to be acted upon. And so for the sake of my commitment to Jesus Christ, I'm going to choose not to act on that desire. And the weight that they carry is greater than most. But I will tell you, I am proud to worship Jesus alongside them. Here's the fourth truth that I want to share with you today. And this is really for all of us. We all need sexual redemption. And through Christ, sexual redemption is available to all of us. Hebrews chapter 10 says this, dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. The key word here is deliberately. Picture two people with me. The first person says, you know, I'm really struggling with a sexual sin in my life. 
And I'm trying to fight against it, but I keep falling into the same pattern and the same habit. But I, when I do it, I confess, I own it, I come before God, I say, God, I'm so sorry, I repent, and I'm going to try to turn away from it. I believe that person is right with God. The second person says, you know, God, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe in your life, death, and resurrection. But I, when it comes to these issues here, I'm going to kind of just do what I want. And I might even talk myself into the fact that it's not a sin in the first place. I don't need to worry about it. It's not harming anyone else. And that person, it says, is like trampling on the sacrifice of Christ. God so loved us that he sent his one and only son to die a brutal death on the cross. The physical, emotional, spiritual pain that Jesus went through to take our sins. And when we say, God, I don't really care. I'm just going to kind of do what I want. It's like we're trampling on that sacrifice. So as we close out today, I wanted a moment for us to draw close to God. I wanted a moment for us to surrender any sexual sin that's in our life to him. And this is not a moment to go, okay, this would be great for this guy over here, and I know that, and I really hope they're listening. This is a moment of self-reflection. This is a moment of, God, is there anything in my life that is displeasing to you? There are some of us here today who are struggling with pornography and fantasies, and sometimes we don't even want to, and we feel guilty and shameful afterwards. And I just want you to know today that God can set you free from that bondage. There are some of us here today who deal with the baggage from hookups and breakups in our past, and we haven't healed from that yet. And my hope is in this moment that there would be a healing that would take place in your heart. And there are some of us who have been sexually assaulted. I got an email from a girl this week. She said, six years ago, I was sexually assaulted. It changed a lot of things in my life. I talked to another person who said that she was sexually abused. And even though she knew it wasn't her fault, she said, logically, I know it's not my fault, but I still felt so much shame. And I felt like I couldn't talk to anyone about it. And so if that's you here today, my hope is in this moment that there would be something that would happen and shift in your heart, that God would bring a healing, and God would allow you to be able to talk to even just one other person about what happened to you that God would bring healing into your life. I love what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It said, for God made Christ who never sinned. Jesus never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. The way a person is made right with God is when they turn from their sins and they put their faith in Jesus. And the next verse, he says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, and the new life has begun. For some of us today, it's an opportunity to step out of an old life and step into a new life that Jesus Christ has for us, to find freedom in Christ, to find healing in Christ. And so if you would, would you just take a moment and spend some time in prayer? Just invite you to close your eyes right where you're seated and just listen to God and talk to God about the issues in your life. And then we're going to sing together, Lord, I need you. Lord, I surrender to you. Take a moment to pray to him.
together. God, that's our prayer. Lord, we need you. All of us do, God. We, we need you. God, we need your grace. We need your mercy. We need your forgiveness. We need your hope. We need your presence. And so God, right now we surrender to you. If there's anything in our life, if there's anything in our heart that is displeasing to you, God, that's of our old life, we surrender that to you. God, if there's any sin that's been committed against us, and even though we know it's not our fault, there's pain and there's shame in our life that exists. Lord, I pray for that person right now that there would be a healing in their heart, that they would know that you are with them. God, I, I, I pray that as we go from this place that we would be people who speak the truth but do so in love. That we wouldn't compromise the truth or disregard the truth, but we would do it in such a way that the tone is loving and caring and compassionate. And so, Lord, may we be full of truth. May we be full of grace, just like Jesus Christ was. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Hey, if there's anything in your life that you need prayer for, we've got a group of people up front who would love to pray for you. Otherwise, have a great weekend, everybody.